alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dearest respective viewers and welcome to Live in London Tonight's show will be commemorating the death of Imam Hassan al-Askari who is the father of Imam in Zaman and we send our deepest condolences to Imam Mahdi But who was Imam Hassan al-Askari? What sort of legacy did he leave behind? And how did he impact the religion of Islam? Why is he buried in Samarra? These questions and more will be discussed with my guest, Dr. Sayyid Amar Akshwani. Sayyid Amar, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, very well, thank you. Alhamdulillah, our condolences to everybody on the, on the martyrdom of Imam al-Askari, alayhi salam. Definitely, definitely. Imam al-Hassan al-Askari being such an important Imam, as in he's the father of Imam al-Zaman, why do you think the community is not doing enough? Why are our majlis halls empty? And, and why is there not really an uproar and a stir around his death? Yes, it's something that we've seen, I think, um, growing up, that when Muharram and the holy month of Ramadan come, you find that these months the mosques are packed. And then you find that when it comes to Imams such as Imam al-Askari, there are certain families, I would say, who claim to be of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, who probably don't even know that it's the night of the Shahada of Imam al-Askari. There are families who may know but have no concern as to why their sons or their daughters are not at the mosque. And I think sometimes the mosques have to look at themselves that why is it on a night of the shahada of the imam or even on the night of the wilad of the imam. Indeed. Why is there such, a, such an apathy or such a lack of attendance? I think sometimes the mosques have to reflect on the structure of the program, the type of the program. But that still is not an excuse for the people to be sitting at home tonight. I guarantee you that there are members of, for example, the Iraqi community in London who don't even have a clue that it's the night of the Shahada of Imam al-Askari at all. And, and for people who have Imam al-Askari buried mm -hmm. in their country at the very least, you would expect their mosques to be full. There might be six or seven, eight mosques in the northwest London area which belong to one demographic. And I guarantee yeah. you that the age group between 30 and 40 are not at the mosques tonight. So I think it is very sad, but we can't make excuses. The reality is that the onus has to be taken by members of the community to establish these programs. The lecturers are present, the lecturers are there, the mosques are present. And I think the onus has to be taken on by the leaders of the community to address this. As in why Imam al-Hadi, why Imam al-Askari in their position of magnanimity, why the mosques are empty. And I must say that I don't think that's just the case for London. I think if you go into the Middle East tonight, really? I guarantee you that there are parts of the Middle East where you have strangleholds of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt uh -huh. who probably don't even know anything or have not studied anything <coughs> of the life of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. As in there are parts of, I guarantee you, for those who are watching, there may be parts of uh, Kuwait or parts of the Emirates or parts of Lebanon where there are people who love Ahlul Bayt, but tonight will not even know that it's Imam al-Askari Shahada. Mm -hmm. So it is sad, but hopefully with programs like this, we can start to address his biography and the love for the man continues to increase because at the end of the day, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, states... So I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Leaving the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt is, is a message for us to adhere to them, to honor them. Love is not just enough. Love has to be expressed in different ways, gaining of knowledge, following of principles. So hopefully in this night, you know, in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, this could be a kickstart for people who are watching to hopefully establish the majalis and honor of, as you beautifully said, the father of the Imam of our time. Inshallah. Yep. Just a quick message to our viewers that if you would like to call in and you have any questions on the discussion, please call us on 0203 515 0199 or alternatively, you can WhatsApp us and the number should be on the lower third there. Sayyid, uh, there was a more contemporary, there was a certain event uh, time that took place where there was a bombing on the actual shrine of uh, Imam al Hassan Askri in Samarra. Um, your comments on what happened, what the, you know, what the Maraja did in, in uh, retaliation to that and maybe what you'd expect better uh, if there was a, an attack on the shrine that us as a Shia community that we should be doing and upholding. There was a real period of upheaval in the land of Iraq since 2003. And Iraq faced 
t many terrorists who had entered the country, many terrorist groups. There were cells of them everywhere. Everyone had their own interests. And amongst these groups were groups that really believe that when the Shia go to Samarra, when they go to Karbala, when we go to Kathmain, or when we go to any of the graves of the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, they believe that we actually go there and worship the people in the graves. Even though, as you know, we say very clearly in our you know, salutations yes. towards the imams who are buried there. Mm -hmm. Whenever we stand by the graves of any of the imams of Ahlul Bayt, we always stress on the lines that I'm a witness that you are the one who established salah, gave the poor rate, yes. enjoined the good, and you forbade the evil, and that you obeyed Allah and His Messenger until death yes. came upon you. But sadly, some are indoctrinated into believing that we do worship those who are within the group. <coughs> and it's sad that we don't have this recognition of each other's beliefs and yes. ability to have dialogue because mm -hmm. today if I saw someone in the mosque of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi in Medina and he's praying next to the grave of the Prophet I could say that you are the one who's worshipping <laughs> yeah. the Prophet or you're worshipping yeah. Abu Bakr or you're worshipping Omar but of course the person will turn around to me and say no I'm facing Qibla I'm facing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but those groups wanted to ensure that anyone who was visiting Samarra would be dealt a major blow. There were two bomb blasts. Yes. 2006 and then a couple of years later. The domes mm -hmm. of the 10th and the 11th of the 12th as Imams were completely destroyed. I remember we used to have lectures in London. al Harak Al-Haydariya, the Haydariya youth movement. We used mm -hmm. to have lectures every Friday. And I remember that week when the shrine of Imam al-Askari was bombed. I remember that week people were calling in, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And I, I replied by saying, if you feel guilt because the shrine is being bombed, mm -hmm. ask yourself the question that where were you on the nights when Imam al-Askari and Imam al-Hadi were being honored in our mosques? Mm -hmm. A person didn't need to wait for a bombing for them to reflect mm -hmm. on their responsibility. But alhamdulillah, the work of the likes of Sayyid Muhammad Ali Shahristani, may Allah bless his soul, and others who came together to try and construct that mausoleum again. And I was only there a few months back and I saw how wonderful mm. the structure is looking now, but still there's a lot more work. Indeed. But sadly, ever since then, ISIS <coughs> yeah, it's like a destroyed a yeah, they destroyed, yeah. ISIS destroyed uh, the grave of Prophet Yunus mm -hmm. yeah. in Mosul. And they went about destroying other mosques as well. Mm -hmm. So Samarra was really the beginning of this destruction. But alhamdulillah, you know, you've tried to destroy the graves of Imam Al-Hussein in the past. The grave of Imam Ali السلام, in the past. You know, it doesn't have an effect on us. The shame is on those Indeed. who the Quran talks about the preservation in chapter 22 verse 39 and 40. Preservation of the churches and the synagogues and the yes. mosques. Yet subhanAllah, you have people out there, Muslims, who claim to be Muslims, who destroy the shrines of the grandsons of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Yeah. MashaAllah. And, you know, I remember when the time it happened, <coughs> I remember Sayyid Sistani gave out a fatwa as in, oh, an advice to have a weak period of mourning for uh, this tragic event. It really brought the community together and, and you know, uh, allowed us to... You know, sadly, like you said, we started to reflect then rather than reflecting before on Imam al Askari. But coming to Imam al Askari, um, a little bit about his biography, maybe his father, Imam al Hadi, and what was the situation like for him uh, towards the end of his life politically? Was he preparing Imam al Askari for what was to come? Sure, Imam al Hadi السلام, faced a very turbulent time because he faces not only some of the most difficult of the Abbasid Caliphs, mm -hmm. 
But he also faces a time where the Abbasids are <coughs> growing in their frustration with the military Turkish commanders who seem to be gaining an upper hand within the Abbasid Empire. Imam al-Hadi salam of the caliphs that he faced was al-mutawakkil al-Abbasi. I, you know, you're hard pressed to find a caliph who insulted the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, so peace be upon his family, except possibly Yazid bin Muawiyah, like al-mutawakkil al-Abbasi. And I'm amazed when some of the books of Islamic history showing you the hatred that they have towards Ahl al-Bayt, yeah. but a hidden hatred. Some of them will talk on Mutawakkil al-Abbasi and say, Muhyi sunnah wa mumit al-bid'ah. He is the one who gave life to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the one who stopped the innovations. The Abbasids, remember, before this period, there's a theological clash between them mm -hmm. as it is on different issues. Al Ma'mun subscribed to one particular school of thought. Mm -hmm. Al Mutawakkil, once that school of thought removed, there is the growth of the Mu'tazila and the Ash'arite type okay. theological debates that occur later on concerning predestination and free will, mm -hmm. the createdness of the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. So, what you have in the time of Al Mutawakkil Abbasi, he recognizes that. Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam has a number of followers. Those followers, if you look at certain Zaydi uh, theological works of the likes of, um, you know, uh, uh, Ibrahim al-Rasi and so on, you'll find that they refer to Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam at the mm. time as the 10th of the Imams of the Rafidah. Okay. So you've got this term called the Rafidites mm -hmm. or the Rafidis which was meant to be a term insulting uh, the Shia at the time. Mm. The Shia, if you look at the family of Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, one piece of cloth had to be shared by the different daughters of the house. Now, I don't want you to ever be able to picture what that means, but that is one of the saddest things that could ever occur. Indeed. That some of these daughters and granddaughters of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, had to share pieces of cloth amongst one another. That's a difficult period. And Al-Mutawakkil Abbasi at the same time orders that even those, not only those who come to visit Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam, but also those who make the journey to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam are to be executed. So the Shia oppression at that time is arguably the most oppressive period for any of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt. It had begun really with Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam culminating <coughs> with Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. Of course, Imam al-Hadi builds a family. Mm -hmm. um, Imam al-Askari has an elder brother. An elder brother, one of the most pious personalities in the history of Ahl al-Bayt. Mm -hmm. He's buried in Balad. Anyone who goes to visit Samarra, yes. on their way there, or sometimes on their way back, they will stop at Balad. When they stop at Balad to honor Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi, elder brother of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. Because Imam al-Askari is born 232 AH. Yeah. And Muhammad, son of Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari's brother, is born 229 AH. Mm. And if I'm not mistaken, he dies around 252 AH, around the age of 23. That Muhammad, one of the erudite scholars, one of the grand scholars of the school of Ahl al-Bayt, phenomenal personality. Really, if you look at how much shock Imam al, you know, Imam al Askari was in when his brother passes away, you have some who even narrate that he rips his shirt open upon hearing wow. the news. And when some people are surprised that an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt would show such anguish, Mm -hmm. What we know as Jaza, for example, Jaza, yeah. an extreme amount of grief. He says this is what Nabi Musa salam, did when Nabi Harun mm -hmm. passed away. So you have Muhammad, son of Imam Askari, seemingly dies in Balad. He's going to collect some revenues from some land that Imam, uh, Imam al Hadi salam, owned, and he dies on that journey at a very young age. <coughs> so when you have this situation, 
Imam al-Hadi is now ordered. You're no longer going to be living in Medina. Mm -hmm. You know, all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, yes. their love is Medina. Indeed. If they had a choice to be anywhere on this earth, it's Medina to Nabi. Yeah? Now, what you have with Imam al Hadi, السلام, the caliphs of Bani Abbas, they want to take his family. Mm -hmm. They want to put them under surveillance. Why also do they want to put them under surveillance? Because they know that at that time, when Imam al Hadi is alive, or during the time of Imam al Jawad, Imam al Hadi, there are two very famous works of Ahl Sunnah that are also compiled. Okay. Known as Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Muslim. Muhammad bin Ismail al Bukhari and Muslim bin Hajjaj al Nisapuri. They're both, if you look at the mm. Persian Empire, well, Muslim is from uh, Nisapur, Nisapur. Nisapur yes. which we most commonly associate with Imam al Rada. That's yes. why I find it very funny when people say Shiism is all Persians. <laughs> Or all Safawids. Let's not go there. Mm -hmm. Because if we start looking at some of the most famous Imams yes. of our brothers and other schools in Islam, your Ghazalis, mm -hmm. your uh, your Muslim bin Hajjajis, your Muhammad bin Ismail al Bukhari's, you know, and others of the compilers of the Sahah works, Fakhr al Razi amongst others, mm -hmm. these are all from the Persian area or yes. the Persian Empire. So to say that Shia are all Fors or mm -hmm. Shia are Safawids or whatever other names, you know, I, I'd be careful with that argument because you're going into a very, um, uh, very cloudy arena. Now, when you're coming to these people, they're compiling these works, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih mm -hmm. Muslim. They compile them because <coughs> they recognize that there's so many fake hadiths going around mm -hmm. Islam in the first 200 years that you need to compile a work which is sahih. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if between Bukhari and Muslim, I wouldn't be surprised if they came across a million hadiths in their life. Wow. I really wouldn't be surprised. And I wouldn't be surprised if out of those million, I wouldn't be surprised if they felt that 1% only or less was sahih. Wow. Now, I don't know what happened to the hadith business, but there were scams <laughs> going on. There were people scamming hadiths one after the mm -hmm. other. There were people attributing hadiths from one place to another. And I, and I think what happens is, at that time as well, when they compile the Sahih works, as you know, there's a famous tradition in Sahih al-Bukhari <coughs> and in Sahih Muslim, mm -hmm. where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, mentions that there will be 12 Khalifas after me. 12 Naqibs, 12 Amirs are mentioned in other works. Now, the Shia at the time, Imam al-Hadi is number what out of 12? 10. 10. And it seems that people are aware that, hold on, if this is number 10 of the Rawafid's leaders, yes. Yes. then we may be in a situation where we have to keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. Now, the Abbasid government, hither to that point, let's say they had a capital at one period in Khurasan, another period at Baghdad, another period in Medina. Now, to circumvent the threat of the Turkish military commanders, they moved their government towards one of the most wonderful areas in, in Iraq until today, mm -hmm. Samarra. Nice. Now, Imam al-Askari is born in Medina. Mm -hmm. By a very young age, his family are transported, taken towards, yes, mm -hmm. taken towards Samarra. Samarra, the word, comes from three words. Surra man ra'a. That whoever looks at this place, it's pleasing to the eye. Mm -hmm. You've been there. I have indeed. And you've seen the rivers that flow near yes, it I and have, the wonderful green, yes, lush sure, grounds sure, that sure. are there. Indeed. And inshallah, they'll come back to their lushness very soon inshallah. with the united Iraq where the Shia and the Sunnah and the Christians and everybody comes together in a united Iraq, inshallah. inshallah. Now, they move them towards Samarra. Why? They, they themselves have their government there. And it's always interesting, those who say there's no such thing as Imam Mahdi and so on. So why are they moving his granddad to Samarra? Why are they keeping an eye out? If there's mm -hmm. no such thing yes. within the literature about Imam Mahdi, why is Imam al-Hadi being moved there? Mm -hmm. But Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, and you've got Sayyidah Hakima, mm -hmm. and Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, 
they, they move towards Sama. <coughs> so that early period in the life of Imam al-Asqar is a difficult mm -hmm. one because it's very rare to find an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt who at a, that young age has to suddenly be moved to another city. They'll settle in Medina for a certain mm -hmm. period. They'll settle in Kufa for a certain period. They'll settle, let's say, in Mecca for a certain period as Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen did in his early years. But to find an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt who had to leave or had to suddenly leave one city to go to another, it's very rare. And it happens with Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. So, now you've explained the, the political situation there. You've explained how the Abbasids are keeping an eye out, as in you know, the Imams are you know, near enough towards the end. We've got to be careful here. They're moving to this uh, garrison town, this military compound. Um, a little bit more on Imam Askari, as in who was his mother and him growing up in Samarra. His mother plays a... A pivotal role in his life. You know, his, mm -hmm. his mother is another of these ladies who, um, who's coming from the North Africa region. We had mentioned yes, yes. Uh, a few nights ago how mm -hmm. Imam al-Sadiq marries a lady from North Africa and then suddenly becomes a trend. Egypt, mm -hmm. Morocco, the yes. Berbers, you know, that area. Um, and his mother becomes pivotal in his life because she has to be eventually the one who looks after the Imam of our time. Now we'll come to that. And is the one who executes his will. Mm -hmm. Father normally wants his son to execute his will. Yes. But his mother by the name of Hudaytha, Hudaytha, some mention other names as well. So and so on. You find that his mother is pivotal in his life. Because upon the birth of the Imam, that mother becomes fundamental. The mother seemingly lives more in Mecca than she does with the rest of the family in Samarra. Mm -hmm. But his mother is known as one of the mystical women in the history of the Ahl al-Bayt. When you read the traditions about his mom, unique traditions, I've seen, for example, Hamida, the wife of Mama Sadiq, is praised mm -hmm. very highly. Sayyidah Ma'asuma Qom is praised very highly. Man zara al-Ma'asuma bi Qom ka man zarani. Whoever visits the Ma'asuma and Qom is like the one who has... Yes. Visited me. Visited me. But when it comes to Imam al-Askari's mom, you find that this lady, the description of her always includes the word mystical. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be the lady who looks after the Imam of your time for the first few years of his life, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have a mystical edge. A lady of great honor, great nobility. I remember reading the, the description of her from the likes of Allam al-Majlisi and Sayyid Mahdi Bahar al-Ulum, always a lady of great piety. So yes, this lady becomes fun instrumental in his early upbringing. Yeah. MashaAllah. And, um, sorry, <laughs> was knocked over. Um, Imam al-Hassan Askari growing up in Samarra, I mean, obviously, was his father around or was he put into prison? Uh, meaning, was were they actually allowed to be at home? or was he, the, In Samarra, there's two types of prisons. Uh, mm -hmm. The first type of prison in Samarra is like a house arrest. Mm -hmm. And that seemingly is where Imam al-Hadi is in prison more often than not. In the other type of prison is for your criminals and so on. Mm -hmm. But even if they put them under house arrest, it did not stop them from entering the house at any time they wanted. Mm -hmm. 4 a.m., 5 a.m., smash the door down. Where's <coughs> the weapons that you have? I don't have no mm -hmm. weapons. The only weapon I have is my dua. <laughs> or the only weapon that I have is my musalla, for example, mm -hmm. my sajada. What other weapons do I have? Again, they'll enter. Again, they'll smash the house down. Now, there are ladies in there. Indeed. Keep an eye out on the ladies. Who's entering the house? Where they've uh. come from? So, Imam al-Hadi, alayhi salam, the amount of oppression that he went through was phenomenal. And that's why they eventually poisoned him. Mm. They knew that he had a large following in Medina, in Mecca, in Baghdad, in Hilla. They knew there were underground movements of people mm. who were relying on him. They tried their hardest in different ways to finish him. But subhanAllah, of the legacies that he left us, the great Ziyarat al-Jami'ah, mm -hmm. which many of us read, which I think is one of the greatest works you can ever read in understanding the theology of Ahl al-Bayt and the Ziyarat of an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. But eventually, he is assassinated, he's poisoned. But that doesn't stop him having a wonderful relationship with his son in the mm -hmm. early days. 
Remember, don't forget, Imam al Askari died when he was 28. Exactly. Yes. So we're not yeah, talking yeah. an Imam who lived like Imam al Sadiq until the age yeah. of 68. Mm -hmm. Imam al Askari السلام, died when he was 28 years of age. First 22 years with his dad, because you know, he, he becomes Imam at the age of 22 yeah. when his dad dies. And you see the, the imprint on, on, his, on his ways and how much his dad's affected him. This one man narrates, he said that I. You know, I, I saw the kids playing and I saw one kid yeah. shedding a tear. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, are you crying because you have no toys? Mm -hmm. He's like, no, this world wasn't made for play. Right. Have you not yeah. read the Quran? Mm -hmm. Imam al Askar at that young age. And that shows you that that young age, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were in a different league to everybody mm -hmm. else. Their knowledge is a knowledge which is Hudhuri, not Qusuli. Mm -hmm. Students of mantraq will know. Mm -hmm. Students of logic. You know, sometimes one of the most profound subjects that breaks down what is the meaning of knowledge. How do we gain? How do we learn? How do we understand? Is mantraq. And you'll see that one of the earliest subjects you study at Hawza, when you study mantraq, is that ilm which is huduri and that mm -hmm. ilm which is husuli. Me and you, our knowledge which we gain is husuli. We go mm -hmm. to a teacher, we acquire knowledge, we learn, we study. We... Imam of Ahlul Bayt, salam, Allah inspires them to know the answer to a question mm -hmm. or to have the knowledge of the Quran in a way which nobody around them has. Someone might say, but how could a person who's not a prophet gain such knowledge? Asif bin Barqi and the story of Sulaiman is able to bring mm -hmm. the Queen of Sheba's throne yes. without the blinking of an eye. <laughs> On Moses' mother, the Quran says, The Quran mentions that Nabi Musa, السلام, even his mother, not ma'soom, not infallible, a lady who's not a prophet of God, Allah still says, Ilm Huduri, that direct inspired Ilham, mm. in contrast to Wahi, which comes to prophets only. Exactly. Ilham, direct to Imam al-Asqa, he turns around, he says to the man, have you not read the Quran? Mm. Man said, which verse? He said, Surah 23, verse 115. We've not created this world in vain. Mm -hmm. Says, you see, my mother playing with the sticks to make fire, and I wonder about yes. the fire of the day of judgment. So, at that young age, there was this wonderful reverence. The knowledge was there at that young age. He was with his father, but he had to see harassment of his father by the likes of Mutawakkil al-Abbasi mm -hmm. that pained him and pained the rest of the family. Allah. And his name, Al-Askari, which has a uh, military background. How, yeah. how did he acquire this name and this title? Yes, Al-Askar, there are certain, there are certain uh, cities which are named in relation to them being garrison towns. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, a group of soldiers are traveling from one place to another, you'll find that they may stop at a garrison town. Mm -hmm. Most famously, uh, the land of Kufa. Mm -hmm. uh, Kufa in its origin was a garrison yes. town. Mm -hmm. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas passes through Kufa 17th year after Hijrah, six years after the Holy Prophet Muhammad passes away, peace be upon him and his family. Yes. And Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas believes that Kufa, instead of just being a garrison town, should be a place which is inhabited. And likewise, one of the other names for Samarra was Askar. Mm -hmm. But that was a garrison town. Wonderful, pleasing to the eye, great military yes. place if you're going to counter the oh, Turkish strategic. military commanders. So strategically, yes. it was known for being an area where the armies had settled mm -hmm. and so on. And so that was one of the titles associated with the Imam. And how uh, was the Imam in prison? Because we know that he spent a lot of his time in prison. So he wasn't given the same um, house arrest treatment as his father. Was he taken straight into a cell? Well, interestingly, he, he's taken to a cell and he's under house arrest. Okay. So he faces both. Um, they believe that he's conspired... Uh, spoken out, you know, he, he had actually written a letter. I remember reading the discussion once, interesting discussion, looking at a letter which he had uh, 
written attacking the Abbasid Caliph. Very unprecedented, mm -hmm. mind you, for an Imam of Ahlul Bayt, especially of the time of the Abbasids, for them to write a letter attacking the Caliph of his time. That's why the uh, two of the Caliphs that succeeded that particular Caliph, they didn't straight away imprison the Imam. And so there was that period where the Imam was a bit more in communication mm -hmm. with the Shia. But then later on, again, he's imprisoned. And that is a house imprisonment where they're literally keeping an eye out on him, mm -hmm. on the woman of the house, the midwives of the house. Yes. Midwives are sent in to see are any of the women pregnant because yeah. well, there, there's you know there are clear hadiths there are there will be twelve khalifas after me. There's hadiths about the Mahdi. Mm -hmm. um, it's from my sons. The Mahdi is from the sons of Fatima, not just from the sons of some random riffraff, yes. you know. And so there is this pressure that is there against him. What's interesting is how many of the grandsons of Rasulullah are in prison. You know, you look Majority. at Imam Zain al Abidin had to yeah. be imprisoned. Imam Musa al Kadam had to be imprisoned. Imam al Hadim al Askar. It shows you. And I, I, you know, when you look at Abu al Faraj al Asfahani's book, Maqatil al Talibin, the amount of oppression that the Talibids went through in the first couple of hundred years after, after Rasulullah died is horrendous, no doubt. Wow. And, I mean, was there no attempts to try and overthrow um, the government? The Shia community wasn't big enough to try and, let's say, break him out of prison? Or no, there were, there were to... attempts. There was a couple of uprisings. Um, but they were suppressed. You know, the son of Isa, amongst others, they were, they were amongst those who tried to uprise when they saw the Imam was in prison. But they were suppressed straight away by the military oh. of the Abbasids. And what about you know uh, an Imam being uh, you know in imprisonment? How does he actually do tabliq? How does he reach out to his Shia? I'm sure they have many uh, questions, they have many um, you know issues that they want to discuss with him. How did uh, Imam Askari do? Uh, Interesting. Those? There are certain personalities who play a pivotal role in this period between the time of Imam Al Jawad alayhi salam and the and the life of and the time of Imam Al Askari alayhi salam. Fadl bin Shadan being one, um, Abu Al Adyam being another. Fundamentally, Uthman bin Saeed, no doubt. Uthman bin Saeed is the first of the deputies of the twelfth Imam. But Uthman bin Sa'id had served in the time of Imam al-Jawad, in the time of Imam al-Hadi, and was a pivotal personality for Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. That if people wanted to know, for example, where to give their charitable mm -hmm. endowments, where to give their charitable donations, they had certain questions of a legal nature. Uthman bin Sa'id, no doubt, was a pivotal personality while Imam al-Askari was facing a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. As then, not only is he the one who looks after the, the burial of Imam al-Askari eventually, but you find the Ahl al-Bayt respect him so highly for his service towards them that not only does he become the deputy, but his son then becomes the second yeah. of the deputies, uh, Muhammad bin Uthman. And then later on, uh, as we'll come to our discussion soon in, in probably tomorrow's show, mm -hmm. looking at what happens with the birth of the Imam. So Imam al-Askari and then Imam himself has certain letters which he's able to write. You know, one way is to communicate directly. Yes. Another way is to write letters. Mm -hmm. There are mentions of letters which Imam writes, you know, Ali, son of Baba Way, being amongst those who receives letters from the Imams, the people of Qom, you know, at that time an established Shia community. Mm -hmm. um, from the time of, um, well, one may argue, Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi, when certain people had to leave mm -hmm. Kufa, and then the, the Ash'aris um, who established Qom, are honored by the presence of Sayyidina Ma'suma. Now, yes. Qum is an established region for the Shia. Mm -hmm. And the Shia of Qum are in constant, um, they constantly receive letters <coughs> from Imam al Askari alayhi salam, guiding them as to what the community should be doing at this point. Remember, we had mentioned, may Allah lengthen the life and bless my, um, my master supervisor, Dr. Jasim al Hussein. May God bless him for his, not just his knowledge, not just his wonderful uh, morals, but also his great work, the occultation of the 12th mm -hmm. Imam. And in that work, he wonderfully shows the underground movement known as the Wikala, yes. or Tanzim al-Sirri, secret underground organization 
And that secret underground organization, its role is to ensure that if you can't get access to the imam, you've got khums to pay, for example, mm. or you have certain legal questions, yes. and you can't get access to the imam, then where do you go? You go towards this underground movement. You know, if okay. you look from the time of Imam al-Askari, the time of Imam al-Sadiq, your Yunus bin Abdul Rahman, your Muhalla bin Khunaises, your, yes. your, your later Muhammad bin Abi Umar, your Ayyub bin Nuh, your Fadl bin Shadan. You, you know, and, 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 and what he has as well at his disposal is this underground movement of communication. The people know their job, they know their position. Okay. But naturally, being with the Imam is different from just Obviously. receiving letters from him. Obviously. Yeah. And um, with uh, the Imam being the 11th Imam, did he, in his tabligh or in his letters, was he preparing people for the 12th? Was he, I mean, one could argue the occultation, um, was this being taught and, and explained to uh, the Shia beforehand? Well, the, the discussion of occultation within Islam yeah. can be seen from the time of, uh, one may argue, in you know, the, the, the middle of the first century. Mm -hmm. You know, you got Muhtar al-Thaqafi being described as being yes. an occultation. Umar bin Abdul Aziz being described. Mm -hmm. I, I would say more towards them being the Mahdis. Yes. Um, you know, Umar bin Abdul Aziz on one occasion is known as the Mahdi. Muhtar is known as the Mahdi. Yeah. Then there are different personalities such as Muhammad bin Hanafi are known as the Mahdi. Yes. The Ismaili sect has already mm -hmm. begun the idea that, you know, Imam al-Sadiq's son is now in Tughaybah. <laughs> Others talk of, you know, one of the sons or some of the imams being in occultation. So no. that discussion is already there. There are many traditions from Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, which talk about the Mahdi of the Ummah, mm -hmm. the Mahdi, what will happen with the Mahdi. I can't really say that Imam al-Askari was as blatant in his discussion mm -hmm. of Imam Mahdi as some people would like to think. I even would believe that he doesn't want them to call him for example, by certain names, because the Abbasids would be ready to pounce. But certainly those who are in the close circles, they certainly are told about Imam al-Mahdi and about the Imam of their time. But was it something given out in the open? Mm -hmm. That's a death wish at that time. MashaAllah. Yeah. Sorry, so we have to go to a short break. So to the dearest brothers and sisters and the viewers, please stay, stay with us and as we'll continue the discussion after the break. Also, for those of you who are online, um, please stay online with us and we will be restreaming um, the show. Thank you very much. See you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani and our topic discussing Imam Hassan al Askari. <coughs> if you'd like to call in with this discussion and you have a question, please call us on 0203 505 0199. And if you'd like <coughs> to send us a question on WhatsApp, the number should be provided at the bottom. Also, we'd like to take this opportunity to let you know that tomorrow there will be a special program because, as you know, the two months and eight days of Morning has now passed and the Black Sawad will be coming down and we will have a special uh, program to commemorate Eid al-Zahra inshallah tomorrow at 9pm. Sayyid Amar, we were discussing uh, Imam Hassan Askari, we were discussing um, you know, his imprisonment, we were discussing his communications with the Shia. Uh, more on his tabligh work, I mean, um, was there anyone he actually you know, uh, affected their lives? Uh, anyone in particular, one of his, his you know, Sahaba or something? Well, I think um, what's interesting is the Abbasids are willing to put him in prison but then use him when they need him. There was a period of real uh, confusion 
for the Muslims at the time when a Christian priest was going around mm -hmm. causing miracles and and they didn't know who else to turn to uh, because now many of the Muslims um, when they were going through a period of a drought there was no rain coming down you found that uh, Many of the Muslims were praying and their prayers weren't being answered. But when the Christian priest suddenly calls up, all of a sudden the rain came down. Wow. Some of the Muslims had turned around and said, how is this the case? If we are the right religion, how did this Christian priest have his prayer answered and we didn't have ours? The Abbasids noticed that this is a very difficult situation for them. So the Abbasids had to call upon the Imam. We've imprisoned the Imam, but listen, we need you. You know, if, you've, mm -hmm. if you need the man, why are you putting him in prison then? <laughs> and the Imam said to them, what's the issue? They said, listen, there's a situation that we face. There's a Christian priest who everyone's now believing could be showing that Christianity is the religion of God, not Islam. Mm -hmm. He prays to God, rain comes down. His prayers are answered. Imam said next time when he is about to pray, while he's clenching his fist, open the fist. They said, what do you mean? He said, just open it. When he was praying, they opened his fist. They found a bone there. Inshallah. Christian priest said, how do you know? Mm -hmm. He said, you've got the bone or the remains of a prophet of the prophets of God. Wow. So you're asking God in the name mm -hmm. of this bone that's there. And that's how these prayers are being answered. Mm -hmm. Answers the question, put him straight back to prison. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> It reminds me of how even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, on the night that they wanted to kill him before he went to yes. Medina, the same people who want to kill him are the ones who used to trust him with all their deposits and all of their yes. belongings. It's sad. Mm -hmm. Then there were prison guards who were affected by Imam al Askar. You know, there's, there's an opinion that the Imams of Ahl al Bayt, any language they want to speak, they can speak. Yes. And especially Imam al Askar. Yes. Why especially Imam al Askar? Because Imam al-Askari more than any other Imam had to speak Hindi with this person. He had to speak Turkish with this person. He had to speak Persian with you know, this person. Mm -hmm. Because there were guards from all these areas. They were told to go and torture him. By the time, yeah. by the, time the Abbasid Caliph would come and see what they've done, it sees that these guards have been affected by the Imam who spoke <laughs> to them in their language. Yes. There was even one guard who was so harsh to the Imam. But the Imam would still show him respect. And he'd tell the Imam, my son's not feeling well. And he'd tell him, don't worry, I'll pray for your son. And his son was cured. So the Imam reminds us, for example, of someone like Nabi Yusuf, <coughs> salam, someone like Imam Al-Kadhim, who had a great amount of effect, even mm -hmm. though that they were imprisoned. But they have a great amount of effect in the tabligh work that they were doing. Yes. And in, in terms of uh, great works, I mean, we have, you know, Nashr uh, Balaga from Imam Ali, Sayyid Sajjadiyah from Imam Sajjad. Do we have anything like that, any compilation of hadith or anything, any specific um, academia from uh, Imam Askari? It's an interesting question. Um, firstly, Nahj al Balagh is not Imam Ali's work, mm -hmm. as you know. Yeah, it's, it's the work of Sharif al Radhi, a uh, compilation of the sermons of Imam Ali. Imam Ali alayhi salam. And when you look at Imam al Askari, the only work that seemingly is ascribed to him, most mm -hmm. famous work, is Tafsir al Askari. Tafsir al Askari is the Tafsir of the Holy Quran, which begins and ends, I think, at verse 282 of Surah al Baqarah. Now, it's interesting that there are those who believe in its authenticity, mm -hmm. there are others who question its authenticity. Yes. It's not a complete tafsir. But you find someone like Sheikh al Saduq would use it. Okay. And um, one only has to look within Man La Yahdarahu al Faqih to see how Sheikh al Saduq, for example, has used some of the tafsir of the Imam within this work. Now, yes, someone might argue that Ibn al Ghadari weakens it. But there isn't much that Ibn al Ghadari doesn't weaken. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got a book called Kitab al Dhafa, yes. then you're going to weaken quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, some may look at narrators like, you know, Al Astarabadi and others and say that because their presence is there, these aren't people that you take narrations from. Others say someone like Al Barqi had never come near the Imam. So how could he now be narrating? Um, the traditions of the Imam. Yes. So you've got a school which looks at Tafsir al-Askari in a positive manner. 
in terms of authenticity. And then you've got others who may subscribe to Ibn al-Ghadari and others in saying that this does not come from the Imam. But in terms of traditions from Imam al-Askari, so many traditions from Imam al-Askari that have reached us. Remember you're talking Imam al-Askari alayhi salam um, and the four main works of Shi'ism. There's mm -hmm. only a hundred years difference between the two. There were people who were alive at the time who met Uthman bin Sa'id. Mm -hmm. There were others who met um, you know, companions of Imam al-Askari and were able to yes. get many of the wonderful narrations, wonderful hadiths from the Imam. Talking about hadith, any uh, famous hadith from Imam Hassan Askari? What about yourself? Is there any uh, hadith that appeals to you? My favorite hadith from Imam Al Askari is uh, the hadith that looks at the signs of the mu'min. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. You know, Alamat al Mu'min Khams. Yes. And it's very interesting because we all strive that when we die to be known as a mu'min. A mu'min is higher than a Muslim. Indeed. A Muslim is the utterance of two lines. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. If now someone wants to convert to become a Muslim, all they have to do is utter these two lines. Say for example someone is a non-Muslim, they want to marry your sister or your cousin. Mm. Your dad's not having it, he says you have to revert. All he has to do is say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. He becomes a Muslim. Muslim. Does he become a mu'min? No. no. A mu'min is not just merely uttering in the tongue, but certainty in the heart. Awesome. Quran in Surah Al Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qalat al Arabu amanna. The Bedouin Arabs say, We believe. Qul lam mm -hmm. Say, You don't believe. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Say we become Muslims. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلُوا الْإِيمَانِ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Until Iman enters your heart. Everybody out there can say that they're a Muslim, but to be a Mu'min is a higher level. Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam, one of his titles is Amir al-Mu'mini, not Amir al-Muslimin. He's Amir al-Mu'minin. He's the... Master and the prince of the believers, yes. not just someone who's just saying, I've just become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Those who implement Islam, submit to the you know, precepts and principles of the religion. In the Quran, Allah gives us guidance how to become a Mu'min. There's a surah called yes. Al-Mu'minun. You know. yes. Surah 23 of the Holy Quran. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ and so on. The Quran mentions, you know, successful are the mu'mini. Mm -hmm. Those who are humble in their prayers, those who stay away from vain talk, those who give away the charity, those who guard their private parts, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. In this traditional Imam al-Askari, Alamat al-Mu'min Khams, he gives us what is the signs of a mu'min. Yes. Now me and you look for this because we don't want to just stick as being Muslim. I want to be Indeed. a mu'min. Indeed. The first one he mentions is, you know, the prostration on the earth, distinct to the Shia school. Many times people ask us, why do you Shia pray on this stone? Uh, rock. On rock, on stone. Some call it the Moor, the Sajdagar, the Turba. And we reply by saying, firstly, there were no carpets in Medina when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, was in Medina. Like the carpets we use for prayer mats today. The traditions in Sunni and Shia literature say that when he used to get up from sujood, the marks of clay would be on his forehead. He used to pray on earth. Yes. What do we pray on? Earth. Exactly. And some of the companions used to pray on pebbles. And it was so hot yes. when they would pray on the pebbles. So when in Shia law we have the tradition which says, The earth has been made a place of prostration and purification. Purification, for example, tayammum. Yeah, purifies you. Prostration, the earth has been made a place of prostration. Now you can pray on any earth. You pray on the earth of London, New York, mm -hmm. Paris. But the moment the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, spoke about the earth of Karbala, yes. it had a distinction. My grandson would die on this earth. 
Yes. And that's why you find in Ziyarat al Nahi al Muqaddasa, peace be upon the one who in his earth there is Shifa. Yes. Why do we call it Kaka Shifa? Yes. In the earth of Karbala, there is a cure distinct Definitely. for Definitely. the earth of Karbala. And that area known as Al Ha'ir al Husseini, yes. 22 meters or so, where you can have the option of praying full or the option of praying Qasr. So, number one, prostrate on the earth. Number two, loudly say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There are many Muslims who when they begin their Salah, they begin, and I, you know, when I go to Hajj or I go to uh, Umrah, I'm standing near the Kaaba and I hear, Alhamdulillahi yeah. Rabbil Alameen. Uh, where's Bismillah no, yeah, gone? No, you know, yeah, what do we yeah. do to the Bismillah? Inna lillah wa inna lillah raja'un to Bismillah. Read the Fatiha for the Bismillah. What happened to the Bismillah? Some say it silently. Some whisper it. School of Ahl bayt say it loudly. Loud, indeed. The Imams of Ahl bayt taught us. Begin anything you say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Recognize any act that you do before you begin it. Mm -hmm. Recognize if it wasn't for the mercy of God, you're nothing. Indeed. Number three, a sign of a mu'min Imam al-Asghari says, wearing the ring on the right hand. MashaAllah. Now you have an excuse. <laughs> My dear viewers, he has an excuse. His excuse is... We don't need that, to go there. Okay, we won't go we there. We don't need to go there. We won't go there and it's um, it's my fault, but no problem. You don't, don't worry about it for now. <laughs> I admit it. But normally he has a wonderful ring and I will make sure that his ring comes back to him soon. Thank you. And the rings of all the guys in the back as well who always <laughs> offer me their rings. Now, these stones that we have, what we wear, you tell a Shia from a yes. mile away, they'll have that ring. Definitely. Either the Aqiq or the Dur al Najaf or the Fayruza or the Zumurrud or the Hadith al Sin. Each of these stones has a benefit. Indeed. Some prevent cal calamities, some prevent envy, some <coughs> help your memory. Mm -hmm. Some help give peace to your heart. These are now in the world today on many websites you hear discussions of gemstones. Yes. And the Ahl al Bayt in many of their traditions have spoken about gemstones. Mm. You're allowed to wear. So if now one of the signs is a takhattum bil yameen for a person to wear their ring on their right yeah. hand. For men, you can wear the ring in these two fingers. Okay, the last two. Yes. Not allowed to wear the ring in these three. I think even one of these two is called the ring finger. Uh, the, it's normally the left hand, this one. Eh? Okay. The you, one, yeah. You're more of an expert <laughs> than me on these issues. <clears throat> so you have that the sign of a Shia to, you can wear on your left hand as well. For mm -hmm. women, of course, you can wear right, left, anything. But for men, right. there are these stipulations. Number four, praying 51 rak'ah. Imam al Askari oh, says, You want to be a mu'min? 51 yes. rak'ah a day. Indeed. Trust me, I'm just about struggling to do 17. <laughs> and people <laughs> think, think that I'm a mu'min. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a Muslim, but I'm trying to become a mu'min. Mm, 17 well, wajib, add 23. Inshallah. Inshallah, all of us. Uh, 17 wajib at 23 the uh, nawafil or the sunnah yeah. prayers and then add salat al layl yes, that comes to 51 yeah. and number five fifth sign ziyarat al arba'in of imam al hussein yes. to visit imam al hussein alayhi salam on the 40th of his martyrdom mm -hmm. that hadith of imam al askar is uh, in my opinion most beautiful hadith really if a person is able to achieve these cycles many times people say i worry about death what's going to happen mm -hmm. to me you know, am I going to be victorious? Well, you know, the Imams have laid out many hadiths called Alamat al Mu'min, and this is one of them. And if we can get these five in our lives, you know, hopefully death is nothing to fear. Inshallah. Just a quick message to all the viewers that if you'd like to call in, please call us on 0203 515 0199 with your question, or alternatively, you could message us on WhatsApp with your question for Dr. Omar. Sayyidna. Controversy comes around Shia Islam quite a bit now and then, but this is not too controversial. But let's say maybe a split in opinion, the marriage of Imam Al Askari. I mean, would you like to discuss the two opinions and maybe which one you uh, lean towards? One opinion is that he marries um, what seemingly is a Roman princess by the name of Nargis, yes, <clears throat> or Malika and her original name and so on from the descendants of the disciples of Christ. It's a famous story that she, her dad wants her to get married. The wedding nice. keeps having a calamity occur. Mm -hmm. She sees 
um, in her dream, the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad yes. is asking for her, mm -hmm. for Prophet Jesus's, let's say, descendant's hand. Mm -hmm. And then la <coughs> later on, excuse me, later on, she sees Imam al Askar in her dream. And then she is told that she'll be on a ship. Eventually a purse will come to her with so-and-so dinar. Mm -hmm. We all know the famous story. That's one opinion. Um, as to whether it's seen as the most reliable, I, I don't know. I don't think it's the most reliable. Mm -hmm. But it certainly is there. It's narrated. Um, you know, al Kulaini within al Kafi seems to indicate that... Um, the mother of the imam is a lady from the land of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, like the imams before him, she was not yes. a princess or anything of those lines. What's interesting is that that period is a very difficult period. You've got a lot of women mm -hmm. in the house and the Abbasids are keeping an eye on each one. And so they want to keep an eye which one's got the signs of pregnancy. And hence you yes. see many different names are given. Mm -hmm. um, and I, some of them could be the servants' names because, you know, who is the one that you're looking for to see exactly. the signs of pregnancy? Yes. Now, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given ladies or mothers of prophets pregnancies without the signs. Yeah. There. That's normal. Yes. But yes, you know, the, the, both are narrated, you know, from the scholars. Um, ultimately, I don't know what difference it will make if one is, a, mm -hmm. is originally a, a slave girl from Africa and another one yeah. is a princess of Rome. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they give, you know, they give birth to one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. And in terms of children of Imam al Askari, I mean, how many children did he actually have? Is Again, difference of opinion. Again, difference mm -hmm. of opinion. I've seen narrations which mention uh, a couple of daughters of the Imam, um, as well as uh, the mentioning of, you know, Imam al Mahdi, Ajalallah, Faraj al Sharif. I've seen narrations of a few daughters. And a few sons. I've seen some scholars who try to say there's no sons or no daughters. Wow. And he said, if there was a son, then uh, why has Imam not made him execute his will? Mm -hmm. I've seen those who ask the question, well, where was the son? If the, you say the son went into Ghaybat al-Sughra at the age of five, yes. where was he for the first few years? Mm -hmm. um, and some scholars who say that the only child was uh, Imam al-Mahdi, especially considering the amount of surveillance that was there. So there's a difference of opinion in mm -hmm. the books of history. So coming back towards the Abbasid Khalifat and stuff, what tactics were used to actually uh, see the, the coming of the 12th Imam? The, like you said, maybe they, was, they, they were sending midwives in to see who was pregnant and stuff. How important was it for them to, let's say, you know, catch him? Oh, they, uh, they were keeping a close eye. There's a couple of years of intense scrutiny. Mm -hmm. They didn't mind holding those ladies, pulling them out checking their body shape, checking every single uh, mm -hmm. movement that was taking place. And, and that's why, as we'll discuss, inshallah, in the special program tomorrow, which inshallah. marks the beginning of Indeed. the imama of Indeed. Imam al-Mahdi, Ajalallah, <coughs> Sharif, inshallah, tomorrow we'll discuss those first few years. How is it that in those first few years, mm -hmm. before Ghaybat al-Sughra, before the yes. minor occultation, how is it, if he's living in Samarra, that no one could see this child? Okay, mm -hmm. the, the, the Ghaybah begins... When he's five. But where was he in the first few years? Exactly. exactly. We'll discuss that, inshallah, and how important Imam al-Askari's mother, Hudayf, uh, her yes. role is fundamental mm -hmm. in the preservation of the life of the Imam. But certainly there was this close scrutiny mm -hmm. on Sayyidah Hakima, Sayyidah Narjis, in terms of the, uh, the other ladies who were there, the, the, midwa the servants. There was intense scrutiny to keep an eye out on all of them. Definitely. Yeah. Just... A quick message to um, the um, a quick message to the, the viewers is that, as Sayyid Amar said, tomorrow we will be having a special program uh, for Idris Zahra, which will be tomorrow at 9 p.m. Please join us, and we'll be discussing, um, you know, the the imamat of Imam Mahdi and also the other discussions in regards to his imamat and his discussions in regards to uh, where he was for the first five years. Inshallah, I'm sure uh, well, I'm really keen to hear about it. I'm sure you will be as well. So please join us at. 9 p.m. And if you have any questions on this discussion, please call us on 0203 515 0199. Alternatively, you can WhatsApp us on the number that will be provided at the bottom of the screen. Uh, doctor, um, a bit more towards the death of Imam Askari. I mean, he had a very, very short uh, imamate. It was only mm. what, eight years, you could say? Six, six years. Six, six years. years, yeah. So, I mean, wh wh why is such a is, Does he have the shortest imamate period out of all the imams? Uh, wh why do you think Allah didn't lengthen his life? 
or give him a, a, a bigger, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lifespan. And how was he actually martyred? Well, you know, Imam al Jawad alayhi salam dies younger than him, for mm -hmm. example. But you're right in saying that you know Imam al Jawad's imam it was you know minimum of 15 years, whereas yes. Imam al um, Imam al Askari alayhi salam, six-year imama, mm -hmm. the Abbasids kept a close eye, and they felt that you know what the Shia were mobilizing themselves in Qom, they were mobilizing themselves in Baghdad, in Cairo, in Kufa, in Hilla, and they, they felt that they had to get rid of him. And, and while getting rid of him, as you know, the poison was administered to him, mm -hmm. they kept a close eye. Um, he has, a, you know, his brother is alive at the time by the name of Ja'far. He has another brother by the name of Hussein, a mm -hmm. sister by the name of Alia or Aliya. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Abbasids, you know, as was their policy with the Imams from Imam al-Baqir, they wanted to get rid of them, seeing that the Alids were always a potent force while mm -hmm. their Imam was alive. And about his brother, uh, Jafar, is, I'm, I'm aware he's known as Jafar the Liar. Is, how did he get this title? And don't you think this is a bit disrespectful to uh, a brother of the Imam? Well, if you're looking at the, the scenes surrounding the death of the Imam and the beginning of the period of the Imam of the 12th Imam, um, you'll find that Jafar actually makes a claim for an imam as seemingly mm -hmm. within the traditions. You see, some traditions mention a person making a claim for the imamat. Others mention that a family member of the imam makes a claim for the imamat. Others mention him by name. And you've got, you know, some of these tawqiyat which really come down harshly um, on, on Jafar. However, we also have a tradition that his position is similar to the position of the brothers of Nabi Yusuf alayhi oh, okay. Allah eventually forgives them. Mm -hmm. And you look in the Quran in Surah 12 where Yusuf begins with, um, uh, you know, don't worry, you know, Allah has the all forgiving when they come and see him eventually and they find out who he is. And so we have a tradition that says Ja'far, the brother of Imam al-Askari's position is like that of Yusuf's brothers. Eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of Tawbah for those who seek it. Definitely. With your permission, we go through a couple of questions. Yep, I mean, yep, go what's, ahead. What's that's been popping in? Uh, uh, it's a good one. What advice can you give for the one who wants to learn the interpretation of the Holy Quran? And what resources can one use to do that? Um, this is for a question from Sweden. I mean, we've talked about uh, Imam Hassan Askari's uh, tafsir. Uh, maybe that would be a good way to start. Uh, to, to look at interpretation of the Quran. Is there any tafsirs that you actually recommend? Well, I'd say um, an enlightening commentary of the Quran uh, by Faqih Imani, I think is a, is a great work in the English language. It gives the whole tafsir, uh, the tafsir of the whole Quran. It's available on alislam.org. I also believe communication with one's resident alim or one's resident scholar to sit with them and say, why can't we have tafsir classes every Thursday night, for yeah. example? or every Saturday afternoon, or something along those lines. You sit together, get a group of friends of you, sit with your you know, local Mawlana or your local mm -hmm. scholar, and pick, you know, pick different chapters and sit with them. Um, they'll give you great interpretation. They'll give you the knowledge that they've gained in their studies. Um, also, look for online courses. Mm -hmm. There are many uh, institutions, both in the East and the West, that offer online tafsir classes. Um, a question here. In regards to reading material for uh, the biography of Imam Hassan al-Askari uh, and the 12th Imam as well, is there anything you recommend for, let's say, this discussion we've had today? Any good reading material for uh, the viewers? <clears throat> reading material for the viewers, I would say, may Allah bless the soul of um, the great scholar Sharif Baqi <coughs> al-Qarashi. Mm -hmm. And he has a wonderful biography of Imam oh, al Askari. Yeah. I've read, I think he's done the whole compilation. Yeah, he's done all, 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 yeah, all the, you know, there's yeah. the whole compilation, um, the whole series on the infallibles. Yeah. His, his work on Imam al Askari is a great work. It's a good in depth analysis looking at the life of the Imam. Um, to look at that period of um, confusion that seemingly affects everybody because of the you know, intense pressure and scrutiny concerning the Imam and his position. You know, crisis and consolidation is an interesting work to look at um, by, you know, one of the great scholars who is alive today by the name of um, uh, Sayyid Hussein al-Mudarrasi. Mm -hmm. So those are works that, you know, look at that period in particular, which are definitely worth reading. And my, as I said, my supervisor, Dr. Jasim Hussein, his work, The Occultation of the Twelfth Imam, yes. gives a bit of analysis in relation to that period yes. preceding the occultation. Thank you.
Another question here. Um, I feel distant from God despite praying five times a day and reciting the Holy Quran every day. How or what do I do to feel better and more connected to God? Well, you know, praying five times a day and reciting the Holy Quran is not, you know, the only way mm -hmm. um, to get closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There, there are other ways. Serve in your local community. You know, it's a fantastic way. You serve the creation, you're serving the creator. Get involved. Teach in your local school. Teach the, the youth um, about Islamic history, Islamic law, Islamic theology. Um, volunteer in your local community to help the homeless, mm -hmm. um, you know, to cook for those who are poor, uh, to help people uh, gain an education. These are all godly virtues. Let's not limit to religion to praying only and, you know, acts of worship. Yes. There are other voluntary works which are seen as being divine in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know we, we talked about this. This is a new question. Uh, we, we, we roughly uh, touched upon it. I think this is actually quite a nice one because it goes into a bit more detail. As in, if the Imam Hassan Asghari's wife was a Roman princess, how did he actually, how did the, the two meet? Uh, like like I said, um, so this is that there was a war that had taken place, um, which is interesting if anyone finds it in, in any of the you know, non-Muslim literature about that war that's taken place. Um, but seemingly there's a war that takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, she already knows that she has to board the ship and eventually uh, Imam al-Hadi would have sent uh, one of his representatives who will say certain words, give her a red purse and then she'll know that mm -hmm. she is to go towards that direction. Nice. Uh, last question here. Um, a thick question. Um, if someone is uh, in a state of Nijasa, are they still allowed to read Ziyara and uh, Quran and things like yeah, that? Yeah, reciting of the Ziyara, uh, reciting of the Ziyara of the Imams of Ahl al Bayt, there's no issue. There, there are a couple of issues if one wants to go into that uh, haram um, mm -hmm. of an Imam of Ahl al Bayt salam, then that person, um, according to many of the scholars, either can't go in or has to go straight through without staying in that place at that time. Yeah. Dr. Omar, thank you very much for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Uh, learn a great deal, mashallah. My pleasure and our condolences to everyone, indeed, inshallah. Indeed. Tomorrow, Eid al Zahra, will inshallah, be a day of celebration. Definitely. A lot, any last points that you want the viewers to take away with them from tonight's discussion? I, ju I just sincerely hope that um, the viewers speak to their mosques and ensure. Um, that the Imams of the likes of Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Haskari mm. don't have 20, 30, 50, 40 people turn up and instead we one day reach a stage where the same numbers that come for Muharram are the numbers that come Inshallah. to honor the great We're grandsons um, of Imam al-Hussein and the grandparents of uh, Imam al-Hujjah Ajal Allah Faraj al Thank you very much. As you heard from Dr. Ahmad, tomorrow we'll be having a special program at 9pm. Please join us then uh, for myself and from Dr. Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.